Now, we are live. <laughs> Hello everyone. Uh, I'm a bit happy to present our today's guest uh, today, Hugo Guerra. Um, he's a compositor, supervisor, and uh, he's a real streamer, um, not as me. Uh, he has a um, Twitch stream channel called Hugo Desk. But probably Hugo knows how to introduce him better than me. <laughs> so, <laughs> hello everybody and welcome Hugo. Hi everyone, hi everyone. Uh, well, first of all, let me thank you so much for inviting me for this stream. Um, haven't done a stream in a while, as people know, I've been hunting for my house, for a new house, so I have uh, kind of paused my Twitch streams. But yeah, my name is Hugo Guerre, and for those of you that don't know me, I am a director and a visual effects supervisor. I have um, about 20 years experience. Um, I've worked for many companies, including I was the head of composting at the mill in London. I worked for Sony Pictures. I've worked for Ubisoft. I worked for Nexus, for a bunch of companies uh, all over the world. Um, and yeah, as, as, as you mentioned, I do have a YouTube channel called Hugo's Desk and also a Twitch uh, channel called Hugo's Desk as well. And um, yeah, that's it really, not, not much. I'm Portuguese, I guess. Most people here on the audience, I'm sure they know me. They're all saying hello, so I'm sure they already know me anyway, so. Yeah, I, I also think that you know Hugh Gavin better than me. Uh, so <laughs> uh, we are here to learn Phase Builder Node. And uh, it's uh, uh, actually a fifth stream in our series. And if you have any questions, please ask them in uh, the YouTube chat. And uh, Hugo, could you be so kind to read this question? So actually, Hugo is your voice today. And um, yep. so I'll choose who gets to talk and who doesn't get to talk. So you better behave. You better behave on the chat, okay? <laughs> and if you have any questions between uh, our uh, live streams, please join us in uh, this Discord server and we are always here, there and uh, answering your questions. So, uh, but before we start, I'd like to discuss several news as a icebreaker. Oh, oh no, don't do that. <laughs> no, let's not talk about this now. Come on. <laughs> I'm joking. Actually, uh, and probably the most notable news, uh, of course, is a Nuke India thing, which was announced several days ago. So, what do you think about this move from Foundry? Are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I've already been, um, I've already had this discussion online by a lot of people because um, I think I'm one of the few people that think this is a positive step um, because, and I've been... Uh, very harshly attacked online because of this. Uh, but I, maybe now I can probably give a bit of an explanation why I think this is a good idea. So obviously, everyone is very unhappy that you have limitations and that you don't have plugins and a third party, which is a major limitation. Yes, it is. And that Python is very limited as well. All those things are true. And also the limitation of the, of the scripts not being, the scripts being encrypted. All these things are really bad things, and I've discussed them with the Foundry. I knew about Nuke Indy a couple of days before it was released, and I had meetings with them. I gave them my extensive feedback about that, and I told them that it was a bad idea. But, but you know, they decided to launch it like this. That's fine. It's it's their decision. It's a company. It's not my company. So, I feel like um, it's definitely an amazing step to the correct direction. I feel like Nuke needs to be cheaper. It's always needed to be cheaper, but it's complicated to make it cheaper. You know, it's very complicated because you have large studios that paid a fortune for it, including myself. You know, my studio, I've paid full licenses of Nuke already. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit of a tricky road to just lower the price completely. But I definitely think this is definitely going to unlock a lot of things. You know, I, I feel like this is the first step. And I, I can assure you, I am certain. I mean, I've been wrong before, but I'm certain that this will lead to a reduction of price of the regular Nuke. I think that's what's going to happen. This is just the first step. I feel like this Nuke Indy will eventually, without knowing, of course, what's going to happen, but I, I feel like 
New Candy will become a lot better. It will have more features. It will have third-party plugins. It will have Python. I believe that it will actually be very complete at some point. And, and it will still probably even be cheaper than what it is now. And I feel that Nuke X will drop dramatically its price, uh, the, the full version of Nuke. So I think this is the first step. And I, I wish people understood that it's not very easy to move a big, big company like the Foundry. It's very tough to just like cancel all the income of the company one day from the other. And also, I think people are, are being very harsh about the situation because the Foundry is uh, trying their best to listen to our features. They're trying their best to create something. Nuke Indie was the most requested version of Nuke, uh, you know, by everyone. And they've managed to deliver one, obviously, with a lot of limitations and people are very frustrated about that. But I feel like people also have to kind of wait and see and also use their wallets, you know, because if they're not happy with this, then they don't buy it. You know, that's, I think, the, the clear thing. If the foundry finds that there's no clients for it, they will probably change it. And I feel like the customer is the one that can steer this ship. And I feel like from all the social media backlash that it was about this, I feel that people should be more constructive with their feedback. I feel they need to be more positive and they need to feedback them with the correct channels. There's no point of you just shitting on the nukes indie on Twitter because they're not going to see that, you know, like well. it has to be through support. It has to be through the proper channels uh, so that you give them feedback properly so that they can adapt to the software. So that's my opinion. I think it's a, an amazing step on the correct direction. I feel like it has a lot of limitations and a lot of problems, but it's much better than not having it. That's my view on it, you know. So I think that's how we should go. And we just need to continue to force the foundry into this. Like, so we just need to continue to give them positive and constructive feedback through the correct channels so that it evolves to a better situation. Yeah, it really seems that you had lots of discussions on <laughs> social networks about it. <laughs> I had, I had, I had hundreds and hundreds of uh, posts and I, I also got very attacked uh, 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 in private uh, uh, comments as well. I see. Uh, a lot of no, people. No, I understand gave... why. <laughs> why. Yeah, <laughs> because 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 I was the first one to say that this was a good idea on on social media, and then I got a lot of attacks. I I got a lot of abuse online about this. I got it on Twitter. I got it on Facebook by private by basically cowards because they don't even have the courage to do it in public. Well, so okay. it was it was not good. It was not good at all, and I feel like. I am very embarrassed and also very ashamed of this community because of doing this. And I feel like people should really be more constructive. There is no point of us just like treating people badly like this because I am not paid by the foundry. I'm not an employee of the foundry and I've, I'm one of the most critical people giving them feedback. And it's very unfair that people are treating me badly because of this product. I have no stake on this product. I know for a fact that it's a good idea and I know that it's going to get somewhere, but people just have to be a bit more calm about it, you know? Well, speaking about limits and some limitations, and of course, as a plugin developer, uh, we were a bit um, um, worried about uh, plugin support. Yeah? And uh, of course. we approached Creative, uh, product. Uh, manager for Nuke uh, at Foundry and yeah. uh, the good news that they are really investigating uh, possibility to adding third-party plugins to uh, <laughs> of course they are <laughs> of course they are after what happened two days ago of course they are <laughs> it's <Because> not <laughs> it, of course it's not uh, some public commitment from their side uh, yeah. it's really hard for the company of their size uh, to promise something for sure but uh, yeah. I believe that they really feel that uh, third-party plugins it's uh, something yeah. which is crucial for almost every uh, composter at the moment and uh, it will give know? them kind of a positive uh, feedback loop when more people yeah. will create plugins for Nuke yeah. because yeah. Uh, before we really felt like a bit limited with uh, the nuke price, mm -hmm. but there were several times when people bought uh, nuke sp 
specifically for using our tools, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, uh, which is I, like... I, I, I think I, I can guarantee you that they will change that. I can guarantee you. I'm not saying no one has told me that they're going to do it, but after the backlash that happened online, and also not to mention, you know, like I said, I, I had a meeting with the foundry the day before this launch, and they showed me this product both to me and to Victor Paris. We had a meeting, me and Victor, about this. And the first thing I told the foundry, as soon as they've showed me the slide with the limitations, first thing I said, come on, guys, you cannot remove third-party plugin because of neat video, PG Bouquet, and, and also Ken Tools. And they, I'll be honest, like, as I said, I'm not paid by the foundry. I can have my own opinion. I felt, I'm, I'm sure maybe I'm wrong, but I felt that they were not aware how important these three plugins were in the industry. I felt that the marketing department was not really completely aware that these are industry standards. I feel like, you know, for them, PG Bokeh is not necessary because people can use ZD Focus and ZD Focus is a bit of a joke. It doesn't really work um, it, because it's not really like a camera. It doesn't function like a camera. So you need to use PG Bokeh. The same way with Neat Video, you need to use Neat Video because the denoising node in Nuke is a joke as well. And not, not to mention that the can, can tools there's not even an option in Nuke. You can't even do the face modeling. You can't even do that inside of Nuke. So, so I I have a feeling that marketing should have told me like like the same way they called me and Victor the day before to talk about this. They should have done that a month ago, you know. And I I feel like I felt that they were surprised. Maybe I'm wrong, you know. Maybe they were very aware of it and they made that decision for other reasons. But I. I just have a feeling that they thought, oh, plugins, you know, no one cares about plugins because people just have gizmos. But I, I, I feel, yeah, sorry, guys. I know Mocha is also important, but sorry, I don't use Mocha, so I always forget about Mocha. <laughs> um, but that's the feeling I had. And, and I, 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 I think now with my feedback and Victor's feedback and the backlash, I think it's going to happen. I, I'm pretty certain it's going to happen because I don't think it will... Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I feel like a lot of people are not going to buy it because of this specific thing, you know? Yeah, and many um, people will so. buy it uh, if they um, will support third-party plugins. I yeah. believe that we, at least we have lots of uh, questions about it at, yeah. on a weekly basis. So the yeah. other important news was Blackmagic uh, 12K camera, yeah. uh, which... Uh, Probably, will it also relates to compositing, of course, because of course, yeah. it means that. Uh, yeah, I have I have the old one there. Look, you can see it on my desk. Oh, you don't see it because it's cropped. But I have the the Urza Mini Pro on my on my shelf here. So I have a lot to say about this as well. So that's good. Yeah. So <laughs> <glad> that... <laughs> uh, as for me, uh, the most interesting thing about uh, this camera was uh, basically its uh, sensor. They mm -hmm. have really new type of sensor, uh, mm -hmm. which I don't know how it's called, like just black magic egg, but it's definitely not a bare uh, standard sensor. No, uh, it's not, no. Which, is, which basically means that uh, they have a really huge density of pixels, and this density is pretty the same like in uh, human eyes, and, mm -hmm. uh, which is good, and... Uh, but the density of uh, green pixels will be almost the same because now mm -hmm. it's three times uh, less than before uh, in bare sense. So they yeah. and basically it means that uh, probably it won't help us in uh, green king, probably a little bit. Uh, but uh, yeah, I believe that uh, uh, it's soon yeah, will so, be a, a standard for yeah. quite a lot of things. Like, yeah. so, so I the, remember so the, these discussions, like even with for HD, even for HD, even then for full HD, then for uh, 4K, then 6K, I skipped 8K probably, but yeah, now we have discussions for 12K. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so for me, I have a lot to say about this camera. Like, first of all, I would say that I'm already going to tell everyone, like, I already bought the camera, so I pre-ordered already the camera. 
Um, so I did the pre-order on the first day that it came out. Uh, not because the camera is outstanding, not because of that, but because I am, I, 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 I use cameras all the time on set and I use cameras on my work all the time, especially for my personal work. And I felt that it was a really good replacement for my old uh, Urza Mini Pro, which I bought three years ago. Uh, so I feel like this is, there's a lot of bad things and a lot of good things. And I'm, I'm, I'm give the pros and cons a bit about this. So first of all, I think from the, the bad things, I'll start with the bad news. Um, I feel like it's a waste, like it was uh, 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 unfortunate that the f that uh, Blackmagic did not make a larger sensor. So I would have preferred to have 8K or 6K with a larger plate, a larger sensor back plate, because I am, I am much more interested on, uh, you know, a good uh, dynamic, like a good, good, good depth of field, a good bouquet. And obviously, if you have a better, a bigger backplate, you can have much nicer bouquet and a much nicer field of view. And you can actually compete against the Alexa 65 or even IMAX. So I felt it was a, uh, it was a shame that they didn't really investigate the way to do a larger sensor instead of just putting more pixels on the same sen on the same size. So that, that, that's one of the, my bad news about this. I feel that that's a, a mistake from their part. And I... I feel I feel we don't really need 12K, but the other thing I also feel like it's the bear sensor has a lot of problems, of course, but this is a brand new type of way of making images. Uh, it has advantages and disadvantages. One of the major advantages of this sensor is that it can actually output 4K, 8K, and 12K without cropping the sensor, which is a really good news. That means you can film 4K or 8K without cropping, and that's really cool. Like I, I, That's always been my problem with the original uh, Urza Mini Pro and also the, orig the Blackmagic 6K um, Pocket, which is the one I'm filming right now. Uh, those are major problems that those cameras have. Um, so I think I really like the idea that Blackmagic is investing themselves to make a brand new technology for the sensor, but I think this is version one. And I would really recommend people to wait for version two or version three. I bought it already because I'm just so curious and I really want to replace my camera, but I feel like it's just like the old Blackmagic cinema camera, which I also bought back then. I think it's going to take a couple of versions until it really gets correct, you know? Yeah. Um, now, in regards to the 12K, I think there's some good news and some bad news. for In terms of, of working as an elements camera, for example, if I'm on set, it's the perfect camera, you know, because you can film smoke elements, fire elements, fog elements in 12K, and you have an, an, an almost unlimited opportunity of cropping them to the 4K output you want, you know. So you can literally just put the camera on the set for, imagine Action VFX, you know, they can put the camera on the set, film huge planes of fire and smoke, and just film them in 12K at max res at 60 frames per second. And then anyone can just crop whatever they need, you know, which, which is really powerful, I think. Uh, from that point of view, I think for visual effects, for data and for elements, it's a really powerful camera. Now for, for regular filming, I think it's, it's more a response to the, more and less response to the Olympics. You know, we were supposed to have the Olympics now the, the Japanese the, the Japanese Olympics and it was supposed to be filmed in 8K, and I, I really believe that this camera was created for the Olympics. I think that's what happened because obviously if you're delivering 8K, you need more more resolution for that. And I think what happened was the Olympics didn't happen, and so they launched the camera anyway. I, I really think it was specifically meant for the Olympics because of the 8K nature of the broadcast. Because that's the thing: if we start doing things in 8K, we obviously need more resolution to have an extra leverage for composting, you know, the same way now when we used to do uh, deliveries in HD, we would film in 2K. And when we now film, when we deliver 4K, we film in 4.6K or we film in 6K for delivering 4K. You always film with larger to deliver that. So I think this 12K is perfect to deliver 8K. No one is ever going to work in 12K. No one is ever going to work or deliver in 12K. I think the 12K is just a word, it's just a buzzword that everyone is now talking about. But I feel I feel it's it's just it's a necessary uh, thing that needs to happen if you're going to deliver 8K, which is going to happen sooner or later because if the Olympics are delivering 8K already, I'm sure next year you'll start seeing 8K in mainstream for sports first, 
probably for small documentaries and then later on for film and television. So I feel this is great. I, I think it's a great step in the correct direction, but I'm, I'm very concerned about the camera. I think the camera is going to have a lot of problems because it's version one. Uh, but I can't wait to see what happens. I, I feel like like it's it's a great step to the correct direction for us to go to 8K. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Hugo, for it's basically really interesting opinion about uh, Olympics. I've never thought about it. Do, do you know about it for sure, or it's just your um, thoughts? And, well, um, it's it's... No, I, I don't. Of course, I have no I have no confirmation from Black Magic about this. No, but I mean, it's for me. It's 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 very obvious because how would they going to be filming those Olympics? You know, like yeah. there's no camera right now to film those Olympics. So I'm assuming it was this camera because because there's no there's no 8K camera out there in a in a correct like in a cheap way for you to populate the stadium to film that's my assumption because i never really understood why they were how they were going to film the olympics in 8k and 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 which with with camera you know were they really going to film the olympics with red cameras i i doubt it because that would be because obviously the red camera can do 8k but it was going to be too expensive to have it as olympic camera and especially because this one you notice it does 12k at 60 and for the olympics you need 60 you can't have 30 mm -hmm. you know so I, I think that was why this camera was first created. Um, but now, obviously, they're thinking bigger. They're like, okay, well, let's just use it in film, which I think it's it's obvious. But one thing people forget is the, these cameras have a huge problem because they're really cheap manufactured. And they have a huge rolling shutter issue, you know, all of them. Even my Uruza Mini Pro, it's terrible in rolling shutter. So I really hate these cameras for tracking. They, they are terrible at that. You know, the Alexa and the Red camera is much better at rolling shutter. And I'm sure some people on the audience here know what I'm talking about. Tracking in rolling shutter is horrible. It's really difficult uh, because of the bending of the image. So, you know. Yeah, as far as I remember, uh, cinema camera had uh, global shutter, right? That was the only one, yeah. That's why I still have that camera. The 4K cinema camera, which has a crop of 1.6, uh, 1.7, sorry. Uh, that one is still the progressive scan, and I, I use it a lot, actually. And they've they've silently removed, because the Urza Mini Pro was supposed to be as well with options. You were supposed to be able to choose rolling shutter or not. But then, mm -hmm. the, like, and that was on, on the early marketing material, it was like that. And then it just vanished from the marketing and it never came back. And I think it has to do with the fact that they cannot get so many app stops with the price range. You know, like they, they, the, the, the Blackmagic 4K, the, the, the one I have, which doesn't, which has a progressive scan uh, sensor, that one only has 12 stops of, of dynamic range. You know, that's the problem. With the progressive one, they cannot push the dynamics range without jeopardizing the price. And I think that's the issue, mm -hmm. you know. Well, so let's switch to tracking. <laughs> Finally. Yeah, sure. And, um, well, all the streams are about tracking. Tracking uh, not only about our plugins, to be honest, it's more about some general approach, but of course it's all about uh, our news as well. Um, and today we're going to talk about Phase Builder. Previous four, yes, four streams were about uh, tracking rigid and uh, deformable objects and uh, but then there was a really important moment for me uh, and we decided to create Face Builder. So uh, why we created it? So once Foundry, we discussed them a lot today, uh, created a series of uh, educational materials about tracking and uh, it was uh, created by Joe Rush uh, from uh, Toronto, and uh, in the last uh, part of this uh, series, um, he covered GeoTracker, and uh, there was no face builder, face track, or something like this at that moment. And uh, let me show you a small part of it. So. Now, I don't really have a model of her face, 
but I was just going to use a generic face. This is actually a model of, of my face. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe I can just try this and see how this goes. And if it doesn't work, then, you know, I'll try something else. But just a generic face, you know, would do the trick. And you can find generic meshes uh, online pretty easily. And so... And I literally cried looking at the monitor and said, no, it's not intended to be used in such a way. You <laughs> should create the perfectly aligned models. So usually, so it was expected that you take photos from different angles of view. Uh, more photos, then it's better. Then you do photogrammetry. And then you do retopology on top of this uh, scan. And then you get a 3D model with accurate topology. Mm -hmm. But uh, this process, even it's pretty simple as an input, and uh, it's pretty tedious because, and it takes time. And that's why we decided to create a, something like face builder, when you get photos and straight to, and go straight to the model. And um, the funny thing that usually people use MetaShape uh, for creating photogrammetry. Uh, and uh, then you can use amazing tool, uh, which is called Rep uh, for uh, making uh, clean topology on top of the scan. It actually wraps uh, your topology on top of scan. And both of these software uh, was created in Russia for some strange reason. Even MetaShape was created by my schoolmate. And um, we decided to simplify this process and created Face Builder. And uh, let me show a small uh, demo which we released with uh, the Face Builder. Let's enjoy. Very nice, man. That's very, very nice video. Uh, yeah, I also like the video. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, but it, okay. it's always so smooth and cool on videos that people always uh, asking us, uh, is it really so easy? <laughs> so let's try everything hands-on today. And um, uh, we're going to start with the uh, following example. It, it's a friend of mine. I've catched him in. Uh, no, no. Don't don't forget. No pressure. There's 87 people watching. You know. 87. <laughs> wow. Yes. <laughs> no so, pressure, huh? Uh, more more people um, watch uh, on me. Uh, better uh, 
result I gonna have. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Do you know this guy? It's Vlad. He was uh, working in frame store in London. Uh, uh, probably not in London, in Montreal. I can't remember actually. Uh, I catched him in a hall in, on one conference and took several photos. So let's create a model of his face now. Uh, and to make this I'm gonna open Nuke and I'm gonna import all these photos as a sequence uh, in Nuke. So how many photos do you have here? Like, oh, okay, you're showing that. Like, so it's just like a couple of different angles, I guess. It's yeah. a bit like photogrammetry, I guess. But you, I see that you're not taking a lot of photos, so... Yeah, it's like seven. Seven yeah. usually so, guys, so, so, so everyone understand on the chat here, like, the reason I'm asking these things is because I already explained this to, to, uh, to, to you guys before. I have not used this tool in production yet because um, normally I use uh, 3D tracking, but that's why I'm so curious to see how it works. But I, I was quite curious now when you putting in the photos because it's a lot less photos than a regular photogrammetry. So you don't need as many photos. Is that correct? Yeah, usually for photogrammetry, you have like 60 photos or something like this. Yeah, yeah. And um, here we have like seven and usually seven would be enough. Probably okay. a bit less, a bit more, but yeah. So, and then I create face build node here. Um, so it has, as almost any other uh, our nodes, uh, several inputs, uh, one for camera, one for background. Uh, actually, background is footage and one for texture. We will discuss mm -hmm. this texture input in the very, very end. And uh, let's connect background, but what about camera? Uh, let's try to get information about these photos. So how it's called, meta, uh, view metadata. So let's see what we have here. Uh, yeah, so you're already answering me one of my questions because the first thing I was gonna ask you about this is how do you deal with uh, lens distortion and be really pixel accurate? And I'm seeing that you're actually looking into already getting the metadata because this was a photo taking on with a with a digital camera like a Canon camera. But yeah. how do you deal with this if your camera doesn't have metadata available? Uh, yep, yeah. it's uh, basically we're going to discuss it a bit later. But okay. uh, actually, we can estimate this focal length uh, as well. Uh, so yeah. if we even have no information about it, we can later uh, try to guess or estimate it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. but this time I know that it's uh, 50 uh, millimeters and it's Canon Mark IV, so it's full frame. The 5D, yeah. I can see on the chat Joe, Joe Jacobs is saying that the 5D is dead. I will actually tell you, Joe, that that's actually not uh, true at all. Uh, you know, don't forget that uh, for most photographers, not talking about VFX artists, for most photographers, they need to have a live view uh, port of the camera with a mirror and not actual a digital video signal like a mirrorless camera. The reason for that is because it's a lot more accurate for you to do, for example, uh, sporting photography with actually viewing what exactly is through the lens and not just the video signal. So I don't think that the 5D will die anytime soon. And I, in fact, I think the 1D will continue for a while. Um, it's We're still a bit far from having a mirrorless camera that can match the quality of viewing it through a mirror, you know, because viewing it through a mirror is unlimited resolution and viewing it through a mirrorless monitor, it's not, uh, you know, it's usually it's just an HD signal. So I'm just like letting you all know that cameras like the 5D with mirrors, they're not really dead. They're just going to become more unique and more niche. They're going to be more used by journalists and by specialized photographers. I think that's the case, you know. And honestly, I like that it's so big and heavy. Uh, <laughs> so I've created this camera with a full frame sensor and 50 millimeters. And now we are actually ready 
for uh, pinning our model. So now if I open face builder, it's just uh, some generic uh, head. So it's kind of an average head of human being. Mm -hmm. And um, the good question could be uh, what photo take as a first one? Because of course the first one is very important here. So because uh, um, the, it will actually fit fit the model as a whole. And usually, I if I have such option, I start with uh, three quarters, because it gives you the most information about profile uh, and front view and about three D uh, structure of the head. So I click this center geo button and now I can switch to full frame and just click on any point. Usually I start with nose. I don't know why but it's just so uh, it's kind of obvious for me that try fit here. So three first three pins just place the model without uh, changing its geometry. And Now I'm gonna deform it to make. Oh, you're actually deforming it, so this is not just moving the geometry around, okay? Yeah. So it's basically I do it together. So let's create one more viewer, mm -hmm. and um, and I guess what happens if you need more deformer points, or is this just limited to those points that you have there? Uh, what do you mean by limited? Well, you have those points. You have one on the nose, one on the ear. Like, imagine if someone has a really strange, elongated face or a very peculiar face. Mm -hmm. Can you add more points if you require to do even more yeah, you uh, can, distortion? You, you can add so many point, uh, as many points as you need. So I if, see. for example, here I see that forehead uh, is uh, not on his forehead, I just drag and fix it. So you see, when I drag any pin, it, yeah, I see. it plays a model, and oh, it's, I see, I see, yeah, yeah, and you can do other, okay, and then change its uh, how it looks like. I guess th this is just. There's a couple of people on, talking on the chat about this, like like you told me, like um, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Especially Lee here is talking about... Uh, hi, Lee. How are you? <laughs> uh, Lee Watson is actually talking about the distortion and distortion again. Um, it is well, a bit peculiar for me. I know you're going to talk about that later, but it is a bit peculiar to me because it tends to be when I'm doing tracking, either in Nuke or any other software, one of the first things I take care of is distortion. And I see that you're doing it later. I guess you're calculating it at later time, right? Is that what you're going to do? Uh, not really. Uh, speaking okay. about distortion here, in this particular case. So it's 50 millimeters and um, the and his face in uh, the center of the frame. So mm. we cannot distort it. But actually mm. it won't matter a lot because it-, it, it uh, Okay, usually, don't say that. <laughs> I can, You're disappointing me. You're disappointing me by saying that. I can Because say, it, does, it does have a lot of difference. And I think if you go to a pixel level, has a huge difference. Any lens has distortion, yeah, not of just of course. 50, yeah. But uh, if if we are talking about uh, something in the center of the frame, mm -hmm. it's not that big distortion. I'd say it's almost no distortion uh, uh, in contrast to pixels on uh, the border. Mm. And uh, we can distort it. Uh, actually, I've. Probably all these photos are already distorted, I can't remember. But uh, it won't affect uh, the process uh, mm. somehow. Okay. So if you know uh, grid, then of I'm going to have to try this because, because the problem I have with this is because if you need to be pixel perfect for a film production, you can't have that kind of discussion of, oh, it's it's almost good. Like It, it can't really work that way. So even a 50 mil, like I, when, I, when I map my 50 mil, I have a 50 mil L 1.2 from Canon. When I map it on my lens distortion, 
there is actually quite a lot of distortion on the center of the lens as well because the the glass is is um, there's so much glass on that lens. So um, there is always a couple of pixels off, even if you are using on the center. So I would be careful with that, and I feel like it's probably more accurate if you want to sort the plates first. I yeah, would just course. give that, a, a, like, I, I would just say that to the audience because I don't want them to have the wrong idea that they can just put whatever they want. I understand your point of view that 50 mil is a lot less distortion than a 24 or a 30, of course, but be careful because, but obviously this, this, this has to do with what you're delivering, of course. If you are on a tight spot doing a commercial really quick turnaround, you don't have time for that bullshit, for distortions and this and that. But if you're doing a film for several weeks, then you have the time to go through it. You know, so it's, I guess it also has to do with the budget and the deadline you have in front of you a bit as well. Uh, I, yeah, I completely agree with you that if you have a distortion grid, then it's better mm -hmm. to use it, of course. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, I also have to say that on distortion, uh, pipeline in nuke is uh, pretty good as well uh, yeah, yeah even that's even true. that uh, it's not so uh, customizable like the one in uh, 3d equalizer if you have mm -hmm. a grid it's almost almost good so mm -hmm. uh, we actually discussed it quite a lot uh, on our first uh, stream um, about pin tool so, guys, you can always check out recording and look at the difference uh, and so on. But mm -hmm. uh, speaking about phase builder, I can say that it's uh, if you have long uh, focus uh, distance, it's usually okay not to understart it. Uh, okay. There's almost I, no, I, no difference. Mm. So... Uh, actually, but but, uh, but I I I um I have a question here from Dan that probably is something that you probably want to answer now. He's asking, is there a recommended perspective to start from? Yes, three quarters is the best one uh, okay. because um, it's pretty important to set up accurate first um, keyframe here. So now I can. Now actually I have much more uh, default, uh, it, it's now it's not general uh, mesh, uh, it's not a generic mesh, it's, it's uh, it looks much more um, like And here. so Eric, Eric is asking follow-up question about the, the, the three quarter quarters. Mm -hmm. He's asking why would it be a three quarter best? I, could you uh, could you explain a bit more? I think I already answered it, but actually if you uh, start with profile view, uh, you uh, lost lots uh, a lot of information about depths. Uh, mm -hmm. the same with uh, front view. And uh, but three quarters gives you kind of a combination of uh, profile and front view, and uh, it gives you uh, the huge amount of information about three D uh, yeah. structure of the head. Okay, could I, could I ask one thing to the chat? And uh, mm -hmm. this is directly to the chat uh, of people actually writing questions. Because this is not Twitch and I don't have a way of highlighting questions um, and I don't, I don't have my typical um, uh, mods here, would it be possible, if anyone has a question, could they just type question in front? Because I just start question two points and then ask the question just so that I can detect the questions on the chat because sometimes it goes a bit fast and then I might lose some questions. So if you do have something that you want to ask us, feel free to write question first and then write the question. Is that okay to everyone? It's a good idea. So, yeah. well, the next step. Uh, obviously, one view is not enough. So that's why we switch to other view. Usually I switch to front view then. And now we can fix it on front view. So we actually gonna add more details uh, to our head. So Because now it looks a bit, well, strange. Uh, 
it, uh, kind of drag it here. So now when I drag pins, it automatically solves both front view and uh, the first view, uh, which is three quarters, based on pins that we have uh, there. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't look good, honestly. The good thing about it that uh, you can uh, get the quality you need. So if you are not happy with the quality, you can always add more pins and mm -hmm. fix mm -hmm. it. So uh, Daniel Daniel Miller is asking here. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, just so you know, there are almost 100 people watching right now, so which wow. is great. We, we haven't reached the 100 yet. I really hope we can reach the three digits. Hope you guys can help us. Bring your friends. <laughs> but uh, Daniel uh, Miller is asking here, so are these new points from this perspective, or are you just moving the original points? It's new points. So we have, a, okay. uh, we have um, independent sets of points on every view. So now... I can check the first view and fix anything that changed on this view. There are some changes because the, our model uh, changed a little bit mm -hmm. when we pinned it on front view. I see. I see. Now I see. I guess Daniel now probably has his answer. Um, so Alvaro, uh, sorry, Alvaro Garcia Morales is asking, how many pictures you roughly need to get a good volume? I mean, you said seven, but you think that's the sweet spot or? Uh, well, basically the criteria when I, uh, finish, uh, when I usually finish the pinning process is when I don't need more than four pins for placing the model and I place it and I see that everything is okay. Then I understand that I created a model uh, which uh, fits the actor's face. So I'm, I'm not. A, he's not asking about how many pins. He's asking how many pictures. Yes. Pictures. And oh, yeah, yeah. The, the answer is that if the new pictures, because we do it iteratively, uh, don't bring you more information, then you can stop the process. Oh, okay. So basically, usually you need kind of. Uh, seven or six pictures and usually it's enough so okay, you see, I see. now uh, I already have a model which looks yeah it's getting close yeah it's much getting better. definitely yeah it's definitely getting really close to him um, and it's only a third view now right yeah I have a, another question here from Joe Jacobs he's asking is it possible to have a red highlight representative of the vertices you're editing on the previous mesh to improve accuracy from mesh to mesh alignment? Well, we basically already uh, discussed it internally and prototyped this feature. Uh, mm -hmm. Like having these pins from other views and looking at them uh, on the current view, but uh, it's pretty soon becomes a, just a mess of uh, pins. just really a lot of a lot of a lot of dots on an image and it's really hard to understand what what is actually going uh, what's going on and that's why uh, I gonna at the end of this process suggest some different way how to improve uh, accuracy mm, I see so okay uh, So I have uh, yet another question this this time from Sajel. Uh, welcome, Sajel. Sajel is uh, is also a streamer, by the way. So Sajel has a Twitch channel as well called CG Rockstar. You should uh, check that out as well. Uh, he's one of my moderators on my channel. So uh, Sajel asks a question. He says, do you need to remap the points and connect them up like manual tracking? Um, let the system know it's a corner of the eye in multiple views? Uh, as we have independent set of pins, mm -hmm. no, they shouldn't be connected anyhow. So uh, actually, we even don't use the original uh, plate. It's just for you, just for reference. So you look at it and drag looking at it, and that's it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, in future, uh, we will add some um, AI stuff uh, for simplifying this process because there is quite a lot of uh, different things that could be automated. But oh, that's actually that's actually a question from uh, Milo Lab. He's asking if it is available for Fusion. So you have this tool on Fusion as well? No. Currently, okay. we have this tool uh, in Nuke and Blender. Okay. Uh, Are you planning to have a Fusion version? It's a hard question. We. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a hard question. So uh, I'd say that we'd like to create uh, a Fusion version as well, but. Um, we don't feel any notable demand at the moment uh, okay. from f fusion artists. I see. Uh, so yeah, I see. Okay. I, I guess I guess it's because there is not probably a lot of these kind of things work existing in fusion. I'm not sure fusion is actually being that used in production at the moment. I mean, I, there, I know there's a lot of films being done with it, but it's a fraction of the volume that Nuke has really. Nuke has a lot more productions going, so. Okay, so uh, now we are on um, force uh, view. And uh, you see, his eyes are partly closed here. And <coughs> we, uh, we won't fix it. Uh, like, we, we, we uh, don't want to match them. We just can imagine that they are open and uh, place pins um, with this image uh, with this image in mind. Mm -hmm. So okay, something like this. You see, every next uh, view needs less number of pins because the model is close and closer to the actor's face. So mm -hmm. let's uh, switch to this view. And uh, that makes sense, of course, because you're getting the, the head is getting so close now that you don't really don't need to you don't need to deform it a lot more. You just need to rotate it into place, I guess. Yeah. So uh, at the moment when you uh, feel that you don't rotate it, uh, don't uh, deform it, you can just stop the process. I see. Oop, um, so I had a question here. I, c I can't find it now because they didn't write question in front of it. But let me see here. It was a question about... Oh, yeah, here we go. It's a question, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher your name. I do apologize for that in advance. So a question from Menna Keshi Hadia. I think that's your name. I hope it is. He asks, or she asks, I don't know if it's he or she, how did face rotate? That's what he asks. Well, basically, when you drag pins, it rotates. So sometimes it's a bit tricky when you have a model uh, in front and then you need to rotate it. But actually, when you drag pins, it automatically rotates the face to match the position of pins. So it basically the same like in GeoTracker. And. Uh, have a question here from Sajal. Uh, would you would you do a standalone version of this software in the future? It's not in the plan, definitely, um, because uh, well, it's a three D software. How many different, for example, three D uh, ways of controlling three uh, D software? You know, like with Control, with Alt Shift. Uh, click, right click, and so on. And we don't want to create one more um, <laughs> yeah. way uh, of uh, and one more interface uh, for this and so on. Honestly, I believe that there are pretty enough different uh, application for this. Kind of, oh, yeah. kind of uh, standalone. I mean that because in Nuke, you know, you can't use it in Nuke uh, if you don't have Nuke. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there is a Blender version. Blender is free, and actually, to be honest, uh, Blender version of Face Builder is almost feels like standalone. So you don't need to know Blender to use Face Builder mm -hmm. inside mm -hmm. Blender. Uh, by the way, we're gonna cover it in one of the next streams here. 
Oh, cool. Excellent. Um, I've been looking a lot in Blender, so that's why, like, that's that's really interesting as well to know. Um, I have a question here from, and again, I, I apologize if I butcher your name. I'm Portuguese. I, I am terrible at saying names. Apologize in advance. I have a question from Sub Yajit Daz. I hope that's your name. He asks, after I added pin, can I delete the pin? Yes. To delete okay. pin, you just click right, right, do right click on it, like here. I see. Okay. Uh, cool. So, uh, um, I see Eric. Eric is, is answering. Or is Eric part of. Eric, oh, yeah, no, sorry. Never. Actually, Eric, uh, most likely, if it's uh, the Eric which I know, uh, uh, he from uh, Course of VFX. Uh, oh, I see, I see. Okay. So he's. Okay, cool. Excellent. Uh, and they. Uh, one of our uh, most... Uh, oh, he uses it all the time. Yeah, he's saying that. That's why he's answering. Thank you so much, Eric, for the help. I guess we found our moderator. <laughs> 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 so, a um, uh, question here from Nicholas C. He says, is Face Builder free for Nucor Blender? Uh, <laughs> I can answer that. No, it's not free. Uh, but, but, uh, but I guess, does it have different pricing between Nuke and Blender? No, it's the same plus, uh, pricing. Basically, it's not the same. Pri uh, it's not only the same pricing. It's also the same license. So if you bought license for Nuke, you can use it in Blender and vice versa. Oh, stores. okay. So it's like an OFS OFX uh, plugin. You can install it on multiple applications. Okay. Yeah, kind of. So. But you only it, have it on two right now. You only have it on Blender and Nuke. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Uh, you see, kind of. We almost done. So it's our first view. Let's fix it. Um, sometimes, sometimes, to be honest, uh, if you missed uh, to place correctly the f first view, you have huge number of uh, issues on other views, and mm -hmm. you and you need to fix it. So you n need to practice a little bit for uh, get good results, like with any tools. So it's not just a one one click magic, but uh, it's pretty intuitive, and uh, many of our users can uh, admit that it's not that hard to yeah. learn the tool. No, no. I mean, for me, it looks. I I mean, I'm now watching a full, in depth tutorial of it in front of me, and and. I feel like it's incredibly user friendly. I, I really think it's quite easy to pick up. So congratulations on that to making a, a very good user friendly software, you know. So the common uh, problem uh, which sometimes people try to fix really, really small details and add lots of pins and drag them uh, really like for example like like here and uh, they drag significantly them you shouldn't do it because mm -hmm. uh, usually it means that something goes wrong on one of views uh, actually um, I've run basically the very similar issue here uh, for example, here I have a pin which drags up, mm -hmm. and here I have a pin which drags down. And this uh, blue rope here, it's like a rubber rope which uh, drags this point to this uh, moment, to, to, to this location. So uh, I've created his model. Sometimes, sometimes uh, you can feel that the model is not elastic enough. So uh, that it could be, you want to uh, more, uh, less rigid object, like uh, more elastic model. And for this, in Face Builder, we have a rigidity um, knob here. And usually you use it with auto rigidity, but you can switch it off. And uh, when you drag it, it becomes more 
uh, elastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, but when you have so many pins, usually it uh, has no difference, to be honest, because mm -hmm. they, they almost lock the model. But yeah, something like this. Um, We're having a lot of questions here. I'm just like gonna put a couple of them to you. Mm -hmm. uh, one question here was quite funny. <laughs> uh, one Lou is asking you, if Foundry offers you to buy this, would you do it? <laughs> Mm. To buy the the plugin so that it's part of Nuke, you know. Well, it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you don't have to answer. You don't have to answer. I think. And, uh, I'm just uh, like I found it was funny the question. So. Uh, and uh, speaking about it, uh, we, yeah, we're in like. Of course, there is a price. <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah. What that. Uh, if they uh, suggest us such a price, then we will uh, sell them our tools. It's not uncommon, you know. Like there's a lot of things that happen like that. Um, a lot of a lot a lot of a lot of softwares get bought and plugins get bought. That's very very common. Um, I have a question here from Lee Watson. He asks, "Will it pick up high uh, lids, and will they track when you get it into Face Tracker?" How do you specify them in the pins? So he's talking about the eyelids. Well, uh, speaking about eyelids here, uh, it automatically, uh, there is eyelid here, but uh, you just uh, don't control it. For example, like, like here, uh, we do not try to match eyelid here. Uh, because, uh, and it's very important thing, I've forgotten about it, uh, we expect that all photos in neutral face expression. So it's neutral face. Same on all photos. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's like a T-pose. It's like, like a T-pose for motion uh, tracking. Like, I guess people have to, like, stay, be on a certain way, you know? Yeah, but uh, actually, uh, we can use face builder even with expressions as well there is a small knob small tick here non-neutral expressions and i'll gonna show it a bit later but okay. currently yeah, something like this we got the model uh this model is pretty looks like him uh let's try for example add some projection on top of it so let's create yeah. project 3d connect it to camera and background and apply it to my model. Uh, Aldo, Aldo Aldana is asking, is there a version we can download to practice, like a trial version? Yeah, uh, currently we have something like uh, 30 days trial. Mm -hmm. So you can download, play with it. And... So here it is. It's uh, actually front view projection on top of uh, so that's just the, yeah that's just a regular projector the see okay yeah so uh, but we can also let's go th briefly through the interface we can uh, switch off any parts that we don't need for uh, the pipeline for example head back uh, neck or ears sometimes and usually you need just this uh, part of him. So there is a mouse, but actually it's just internal part of, the, of its mouse. Like there is a small uh, piece of UV between the lips. And you can switch off nose and so on. So it's pretty customizable. Um, so what else? Um, let's create a UV unwrap. And scanline at scanline render and uh, set it to UV. Yeah, so you're trying to do like a typical cleanup pipeline where you're gonna yeah. be able to paint on top, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah, basically, here's here his mouse, uh, I can switch it off, uh, but uh, actually. What else? 
yeah, we can cost. Uh, we we have different uh, UV um, unwraps of his face, and uh, we can have this butterfly, and uh, it's actually have one seam on uh, the head back, and uh, but we have also some. Legacy one, which has almost no distortion, but uh, have quite a lot of seams, and mm. that's why f it's not uh, mm, handy for projection and uh, cleanup stuff. Uh, if you walk on near the seam, also we have spherical one, which basically cylindrical one, so it. Uh, all vertical lines remain vertical in this projection and also max face which maximizes the face of the actor because usually you wanna use the bigger part of UV space uh, for cleanup because then you reproject it back to the um, face so you don't want to lose quality when you unwrap and mm -hmm. uh, I play it back. So um, basically, that's it. So uh, I guess I guess I I guess that now it's my time. I have a question actually mm -hmm. about this. Uh, so because normally I've done this process many times. Like you, you know, this process actually is very common in Nuke, and you can even look back all the way back to 2010, where the Shield Domain showcase this remarkable pipeline of doing UV projection systems on the mummy back then, um, where they would paint in front of the faces. But the process was they basically tracked the face in a tracking software, and then they did rotomation of the of the face of the actor. So because the, the, the face, the actor was talking, and he was moving, he was having expression. So they had to do full rot rotomation animation with a rigged face mm -hmm. so that they could, when they come back to Nuke to do UV painting, the rig would also move and the face would also move. So. How do you go around with that? Because obviously, as much as I would love for actors to always be neutral faced, they, they talk and they do things and they move and they cry and they smile and they, they do a lot of actions. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the fact that there's a lot of animation that probably could exist actually, and then it will be useless for you to be able to paint because it's moving, you know? Well, uh, actually for track and face, we have a special node which is called Face Tracker. And it will track all facial expressions, and then mm -hmm. you can uh, basically lock the uh, projection in UV space and paint on top. So it of works this. in conjunction with this plugin, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So you yeah. then use Face Builder as an input for Face Tracker, and uh, actually, so uh, short story long, uh, long story short. So uh, mm -hmm. we have first we have Geo Tracker. And it works uh, with camera background and some geometry. And yeah, that, that one is the one I know the best because that's the one that originally I remember when you first launched it. It was very famous with the car track where you had a car rocking yeah. on, on the street. And so this is like for physical objects, for objects that don't deform or move, right? Yeah. Right. So yeah. then we uh, actually added uh, skeleton support uh, to GeoTracker to track deformable objects with skeletons. It, and it's exactly the thing which we uh, were uh, learning last time when we uh, were with uh, Victor. And, uh, but to track heads, we created Face Builder for creating model first. And then you can use this model to track a, with GeoTracker and because it's actually a model, you can just connect it to GeoTrack and track it in GeoTracker as a whole. And uh, but if you need facial expressions, you can track it with Face Tracker, and it will mm. deform it uh, to match uh, actors' uh, expressions. Okay. I see. I see. Okay. So, uh, but it's a actually it's projection from one angle of view. But sometimes you want to grab the whole projection. So you need to stitch different angles of view and stitch projection, uh, projections from different angles. So mm -hmm. for instance, we have several projections here and I want to stitch them all together 
uh, and it's not that easy. You can of course draw masks and somehow stitch them inside Nuke, but uh, it's a bit tricky, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So for this we created a texture builder node. And here it is. So it has three inputs, like as well as face builder. Uh, it's uh, not face builder, but as well as geo tracker. So it's camera, it's geometry, and I will use this face builder geometry and background. And, mm. uh, let's make it all. So it's going to start building it from the other angles. Okay. More accurate. I'm gonna delete this stuff. Yeah, something like this. So, what is Texture Builder? Texture Builder is it's uh, still in beta, and it's pretty simple thing. So, in Face Builder, I should write a number of. Uh, I should. Um, Right number of frames uh, where I want to grab the texture, and mm -hmm. it will stitch uh, these um, frames together. For all our nodes, I can just auto detect them, and it will write uh, all keyframes from Face Builder node because he knows that uh, there is a correct position on all these frames. And um, here I'll select something like, okay, for example, 2K square. Cool, cool VFX has a question for me. He's asking if I'm asleep. I am not asleep, Cool VFX, <laughs> by the fact that I'm actually talking right now, so I'm not asleep, no. Um, so Cool VFX, the reason why I'm, I'm pretty quiet is because I was trying to understand what exactly was happening with the, with the, with the new node that uh, he was showing. Um, I guess, I guess, Tell me if I'm wrong. Like, what you're trying, what you're trying to do is you're trying to just use all these seven angles to make a 360 texture. Is that what you're trying to do? Yeah, kind of. Okay. Uh, and I guess the, the texture for you to have a full 360 face would actually depend of if you have enough photos for it, right? So, so you do need to have at least a 360 for this to actually be possible. Oh well, you can stitch together any number of. Uh, Frames. So, uh, if you wanna, ha if you want to have 350, uh, 360, you need 360. If you have okay. just several uh, angles of you, you will stitch them together as well. So, basically, texture builder is a pretty simple thing. It just uh, stitch different uh, projections together based on uh, angle of view. So let me explain it. It's not that. Yeah, I just saw it now. It was pretty slow though to process. I guess um, I guess it's a very heavy node, right? To process all of these photos. Well, yeah. Uh, first of all, because all these uh, photos are uh, a bit heavy, like 6K. I and, see. Uh, yeah, we actually uh, improved it significantly. We're going to improve it in the next release, which is going to be pretty soon. So it actually combines all angles of view and combines them based on uh, how it's called uh, um, based on the normal and viewing angle. So mm -hmm. we have lots of stretchy pixels, for example, on the front view. If we just project on the front view, then we have lots of stretched pixels. Uh, on uh, on cheeks, for example, but uh, uh, in case of texture builder, it will uh, combine all pixels together and gives more uh, weight to pixels that uh, you are uh, looking at. Uh, how, how to explain it? So if uh, it it will actually project pixels from, for example, profile of you on cheek not from the mm -hmm. front view, because mm -hmm. it knows the projection angle. 
So uh, here, uh, let's now apply this texture on top of the, our face. So here's the result. And now you have the whole thing, yeah. yeah I see. Okay. So <clears throat> a quick question about this. Like, mm -hmm. I noticed, I, I have no idea what you're running right now and which kind of computer, but is your plugins or your plugins kind of like GPU accelerated or are they just CPU based? How does it really work? How fast are they and how much resources from GPU or CPU do they take? Well, uh, actually, uh, w currently we use GPU uh, for creating pre-calculation file only. Okay. So it's probably the most uh, heaviest process. And here, when we create some pre-analysis file, we can take this use GPU uh, and uh, in that case, it will and, calculate. And, and what it. what language is it? Is it taking just CUDA? Or does it take OpenCL? Does it take Metal? What what kind of language is it? Uh, well, currently it works only on uh, Windows and Linux, and uh, mm. inside it, uh, OpenCL. Oh, so you don't you, you don't have an installation for macOS then? No, we have uh, installation for macOS, but we uh, can't use GPU on macOS because it's macOS. <laughs> um, well, what are you talking about? There's GPU acceleration on macOS on everything. Like, like you could use it. You just don't. You chose no, not no, to no. use it. I guess uh, that's yeah. different. It's of course it's technically possible. Yeah, we just yeah. didn't implement it for macOS. Uh, yeah. yeah, you probably should look into Metal because you just know. I don't know if you saw a few days ago, uh, Octane just released an, a Metal version of their render engine. It works really well. It's really fast, actually. So Metal, Metal is a very good language for these things because I use it all the time in Final Cut and on DaVinci. It's super powerful. It's super fast. Well, you know? on, honestly, uh, we uh, a bit waiting until Foundry come up with something for Metal because mm -hmm. currently uh, everything is OpenGL based and uh, yeah, yeah. Everyone, yeah, but, but understands. Foundry at the moment is not supporting. Um, they they do have GPU acceleration on the Mac. Because mm -hmm. I have a Mac Pro and it is there. Uh, it detects the Mac Pro, but the, the thing that they've done is the, the because on Windows they use CUDA, of course, but on Mac they've actually uh, uh, wrote specific code just for those specific graphic cards. Mm -hmm. So that's why some graphic cards don't work and others work. It's the same with Neat Video as well. Neat Video has acceleration in Mac OS, but it's like a a, a graphic card by graphic card case. So that's why whenever a graphic card comes in, we kind of have to wait a bit for them to apply it into the system. Um, but when they do, like when, you know, when the Foundry puts, put them in and also Neat Video put them in, they were really fast on macOS as well. I'm, I'm asking these questions, obviously this is just for me because I know I'm the only person in the world that uses macOS on Nuke. At least I feel like that. Uh, but, but, but I do know more people, but they're not as vocal as me. But um, maybe have a look into it because Metal is proving to be quite powerful, and especially Octane X. I've benchmarked it a few days ago, and it is really neck and neck with the CUDA implementation. It's it's really fast. Um, so there's something there for sure. Yeah, uh, I actually believe that Metal is a good uh, step from uh, Apple, but uh, what is yeah. definitely for sure that it makes uh, developers' life much harder. <laughs> oh, of course, of course it does. But that's why, but, but you know, at least I'm happy, you know, I've been using Mac OS for 20 years and I'm happy that at least they finally have a fast 3D engine because it's always been a disaster. It's always been too slow and it's always been very bad. Uh, everything they've made in the past, quartz, every, every shit they've made before, it was horrible. But Metal looks like it's a proper engine, you know, so I, I think... I think maybe this time it looks like they could potentially have some 3D strength here, uh, especially with Redshift developing a metal version. Octane already did that already. They already sold. It's already for sale. Um, so I, I think there is some advantages there. Um, and the cool thing about metal is that ARN, the new CPUs, the new Macs with ARN, they will read metal, so you don't have to redo again the development. But we're, we're getting straight out of uh, out of this discussion. I'm sorry that I, I, I apologize for the chat about talking about this. I was just like curious because it affects my pipeline and it affects my my company because we use macOS as our main operating system. Um, 
Honestly, but, um, yeah. I believe that uh, the crucial th uh, question here is whether uh, how fast and, uh, for example, Foundry can support Metal when they drop support for OpenGL. And yeah, they, they will take a long time and they will be the last software in the world to do it, I'm sure, because <laughs> they always are. They're always the last ones to do any kind of support of anything. So, because, you know, DaVinci already supports Metal, uh, Adobe already support, like everyone else is already supporting it. I, I just feel like they, they're going to take a while. Um, it always takes a while for them to adapt. And also, I've, I've had this discussion many times with them. They don't have enough. I don't, I don't believe they have enough Mac users to actually be that worried about that, you know, so. Uh, well, I, I think that I have some statistics about it. There's quite mm. a lot of Mac users, but yeah, according to, uh, in contrast to other uh, platforms. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, of course, of course, there was Mac. But it's I was making a joke. I was making a joke. I'm not the only one, but obviously there's a, a lot, especially the motion graphic people with Cinema 4D and everything. But I'm more talking about uh, in perspective to the Linux based and the CUDA based. It's 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 a portion. It's like a small portion, you know. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, so we've created a, a texture for, for him. For example, here we have some issues because of the um, because most likely of this view uh, so I've neglected the chat a bit so I'm gonna go back to a couple of questions that were here uh, uh -huh. let's see here so uh, a question here from Sajal um, says uh, do you need extra licenses for render nodes um, no. for this no. Okay. Uh, you need license only for manipulating with the tool. So for rendering, you don't need uh, license. Oh, that's awesome. That's really good. Um, that's really good. Are there any uh, more questions? Yeah, there's a question here again from Sajal. Sajal, as always, is always the, the big talker on the chat. He asks, would you have delighting in Texture Builder? I'm not entirely sure what he means with delighting, but uh, maybe I, I'm just missing. I actually understand the question. And okay. Because that's the thing which we are working now. Uh, because here, if we take a look at the result, there is a quite, it's not albedo. So uh, here. Um, yeah, but the light is from the photo, I guess. Yeah, actually. The, one to, the, the way the solution, the solution would be to photograph it in a more spec, like on a more diffuse way, you know? Yeah, it could be a solution, but we actually yeah. working on some automatic solution for oh, okay. uh, extracting diffuse albedo from mm. uh, the photos. Would Most, you need more dynamic range for that? Because <clears throat> obviously you're just using JPEGs at the moment, but would you need better quality for that kind of stabilization color correction process? Currently we rely on uh, JPEG quality. So mm. actually, on on photos. Aren't you aren't you a bit worried about banding and artifacting because JPEG breaks quite easily when you start color correcting it. Uh, I mean, I'm just saying this because if you take the photos, for example, in RAW, you could bring them in as as HDRs into to Nuke, and then you would have a lot more dynamic range for them. Well, we've invented some magic insight for this. <laughs> for okay. Okay. I see. <laughs> you made some magic. I see. <laughs> There's some magic, yeah, that's good. <laughs> and uh, there's also the JPEG has another problem as well. For an ACES pipeline, if for and for a full linear pipeline, you might have some issues with JPEGs, you know. Well, the best, uh, the most important thing about JPEG, then never use JPEG for tracking because uh, it brings uh, fake features on cross of uh, yeah uh, blocks. Uh, there's yeah. macro blocks and uh, yeah. it this this fake features actually will uh, ruin yeah. your tracking. Yeah, I, I, you know, you know, I, I got a lot of shit on that when I was at the mill when I was the head of Nuke there, and I tend to I, I used to say that to the to, to to them a lot. Like, you know, that there's a lot of 3D tracking people that use JPEG sequences. That's it. They never use anything else but a JPEG sequence. It is a bit. Uh, weird <laughs> yeah. that uh, you have all this information on this plate shot with a red camera and then just they just track it with a JPEG because you're right like there is an enormous lack of detail on a JPEG because there's so much compression going on 
for it to look proper, you know. So it's it's quite dangerous actually to use JPEG on anything, let alone tracking. <laughs> okay, so returning to our um, example, um, I'm gonna fix now uh, this uh, issue. What's going on here? Something strange with my. Uh oh. So uh, he has uh, semi-closed eyes here, and I want to fix it uh, on in texture builder. So I just will cover it with uh, alpha masks. So in here in Roto Paint I can draw. Uh, how to draw? I think your nuke is crashing or about to. It, it, oh, there you go. It's, here. It, it's back. Hopefully it won't. By the way, let's <laughs> let's save it. <laughs> Good idea. And uh, here, I'm going to turn you have a you have a big fan here. So Pavel is saying that he used the Geo Tracker a few months ago on a Nokia commercial to create the blurred logo on the phone, and he says that this note saved is many hours of his work. So, so it's, I guess he's uh, giving you a compliment. A <laughs> well, so. Um, here I'm gonna use black color to draw uh, some hole in alpha channel. My nuke hanging. I don't know why. What's going on? Uh, Sajala has a question here uh, related to um, to um, licensing. Uh, are there feature differences between the personal and the professional license? Uh, also, can I install them on two systems, one at work and one uh, on the go, on a laptop? Uh, well, if you have a personal license, you can use it only uh, for... So only you can use it. It's personal. And okay. uh, <clears throat> you can transfer license between... Uh, your laptop and uh, you can use it uh, on your work uh, but of course on on uh, on your work only you can use it and uh, you can transfer your license between laptop and uh, workstation but uh, there is a limited number of workstation uh, workstations uh, so we can do it limited number of times so we can't use yeah. it on lots of different see, computers I see, I see. Uh, and uh, there is no difference in um, abilities features. in features yeah. and so on uh, uh, the chat is warning you that uh, the red green and blue channel are deactivated on the rotopaint i don't know if that makes any difference for what you're trying to do uh it seems no i, I i've uh, intentionally deactivated oh, them to draw an alpha but it seems my uh I've lost this uh, pop-up for for the color somewhere. Oh yeah, yeah, I see that. And it's I like, don't know um, where it is. It's grayed out. Um, I would just I would just recommend you to close and open again the node. Sometimes there's like some graphical glitch, uh, graphical switch problems. Sometimes doesn't help. Let me try that. It doesn't help. What's going on? Ah, let's delete it. Yeah, do that. That probably will help. Roto. Um, so a follow-up question. Dan Howard is asking, are the licenses logged in base, log in base or node locked when you do it and you have to tra request a transfer? Well, uh, personal license and commercial license, they are both node locked. And uh, uh, floating license, uh, if you need f uh, floating license, than by floating license, so pretty, pretty simple. So you can't pick a color right now because you haven't selected the brush yet. So I, you have to select I've, the brush I've, first. Ah, uh, uh, well. Yeah, so, so select the brush first and then you'll be able to select the color. Um, uh, at least you, you can, yeah, there you go. Ah, cool, awesome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, okay, so let's see here. Uh, not really a Question, I uh, know, wait a minute. Uh, no. Oh, there's a question for me. So Cool VFX is asking me, when your Mac monster turns to 64, 128 cores desktop, you, uh, uh, I think can tools can handle it. No. 
Well, I'm not really sure what I, I don't understand really your question, call VFX, but uh, but I, I'm pretty sure that it will run fine on the Mac Pro I have. Um, I have uh, 28 cores with 56 threads. I'm sure it will run fine on CPU. I don't well, think I need to do GPU with 56 threads. No. For first uh, streams, I actually streamed everything from my Mac laptop. Uh, <laughs> you see? MacBook of uh, 250th yeah. year. Uh, yeah. yeah, it should be fine. And be uh, fine. everything worked pretty okay. But yeah, now I've switched to my workstation. So it's, uh, yeah, now it's clear that everything is okay here. So uh, we've covered is, uh, it with masks. Uh, so we can combine uh, uh, not only based on angle view, but also using uh, alpha channel. And uh, you can understand me uh, why I explaining everything in such details here about texture builder because texture builder is a really cool thing not only for faces of course we created this firstly for face builder like some helper node but if for example in some projection workflow you're gonna combine several angles of view you can use texture builder and uh, create for example you have a tracked uh, let's open some script from the recent for example, this one. Uh, we played with this script uh, several uh, streams ago. And let me show you. There was a tracking of uh, uh, Ford. Here it is. Oh, what's going on here? So to follow up the question from Cool VFX um, while you're opening that, um, he's saying a uh, reason why I'm asked is because I'm sick now with the 64 core CPU from AMD. So yeah, it is true. I don't have 64 cores. I only have 28 because that's it's an Intel CPU on my Mac Pro. But I'll be honest with you, Cool VFX. Um, I have not managed to use my cores, the 28 ones, you know, Nuke doesn't really see them all. Uh, almost no software sees all the 28 cores. It's been really not utilized at all. It's been very underutilized. In fact, the only time I really use all the cores is when I'm doing actual CPU based rendering, you know, uh, in a render engine. So at the moment I've been using my Mac Pro a lot like a multitasking machine, you know, where I can have Nuke and I'm comping a lot in Nuke and I can still have DaVinci open as well, and I can have Nuke Studio open as well, and I can have Photoshop, and I can have After Effects, and I can have everything open at the same time, and it still doesn't really care, you know, because I have enough cores to handle all these softwares, and I have 300 gigs of RAM, so I can handle all the softwares open at the same time, and then I have two GPUs, so I can also handle multiple screens and multiple monitors attached to it, so I feel like it's a great multitasking machine, um, and even I feel like the AMD 64 core is really only usable when you're really having 3D renders. When you're doing just new core or anything related to 2D, you never use the cores. It's just because, unfortunately, most software developers have not managed to really reutilize the cores as they should. You know, most softwares are not optimized at all for that. Um, so, shall I have 300 gigs of RAM? Um, yeah, you, you you didn't hear correctly. I don't have 200. I have 300 gigs of RAM. Um, yeah. Okay, so cool. uh, there was a script which we played uh, last uh, GeoTracker and stream. We tracked this car. Uh, slow. So, and now I'm gonna stitch together texture of this uh, car from different. Uh, from different angles of view, so I'm gonna create the whole texture. So I take texture builder, click auto detect, and uh, there's probably some uh, really strange UV here. Let's wait a little. Um, yeah, something like this. But let's apply it on top of the uh, my model. Please. 
and here it is. So we actually stitched everything together from all angles that we had. We can, for example, here uh, click expand ed edges so to uh, close all these holes. Um, it will helps us. Uh, it will help us for having some um, whole whole less texture. And here it is. So it's it it really helps. For example, in cleanup when you have uh, uh, some geometry and some, for example, person who uh, occludes this geometry and you need to create clean plate. You can just combine several uh, combine several angles of you with a texture builder and get the clean plate and then do your cleanup work uh, easily. Yeah, so, yeah. So that's I why see. that's why it's a separate node and it's not mm -hmm. a part of face builder. Mm -hmm. So returning here, uh, by the way, here we have, for example, some. Uh, I, I can see the advantage. Well. I, mean, I, I can see how powerful it can become. It, this is incredibly powerful for cleanup. Um, for the, I know there's a lot of students of mine on the chat, and and we haven't really done a projection cleanup yet. But this becomes really powerful if you want to remove rigs or remove wires or remove even certain parts of any object. Really, it's really cool for that. And what is also cool, you can animate this frame range. So you can create, for example, relative frame range and take five uh, frames before and five, five frames after the current uh, frame. So you can stitch together really close, but not the uh, current frames together to get the texture. For example, if you have a wire or rig or something, you can take two frames before and after, and uh, this Y or rig will be in different place in geometry, so you can create a clean plate. So uh, I've dragged this expand edges uh, knob, and now uh, it closed all the uh, holes here, and uh, some small holes as well. And basically, that's it. So, and it was the simple way of using face builder. So mm -hmm. when we know camera, when no neutral expressions, and uh, well, all expressions was neutral, and so on. So everything was pretty simple. But uh, there are some additional stuff inside, and let's take a look at it. First of all, texture. Before you go to that, I have a quick question here from Eric. Mm -hmm. He's asking the non-neutral expression, is it a beta feature? Because he says it's not on his version of Face Builder. No, it should be in the last version, uh, okay. which is available on the website. So Eric, you need to update your version. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, texture. So I can, for example, create, uh, let's create checkerboard checkerboard and apply it to texture. So now uh, my wireframe is um, textured by this texture input. Mm -hmm. And how to use it? Why, why somebody need it? So uh, you can, for instance, create roto paint here. Let's delete this roto and uh, create roto paint here. And uh, for example, um, let's take it. Uh, let's take a look at his face, and you can see this small spot here. And uh, I can take my rotor, and uh, let's take. Um, let's create scan line render. Let's create project three D. Uh, Project 3D. So I'm gonna first project my uh, footage on my mesh. Yeah. Like here. So and here's uh, here's this spot. So now in Roto Paint, I will just draw on top of uh, let's 
create first of all some constant instead of checkerboard. And here in Roto Paint, I will draw on top of this. Uh, how to draw? Okay, probably I need to connect my Roto Paint to Scanline Render first. Oh, I can't see the result. I so okay. So. Uh, Ah, okay, because the texture is here. Okay, so I draw a small white dot on top of this uh, spot. Now I use this uh, Roto Paint as a texture, mm -hmm. and in Face Builder, now I have this uh, yeah. uh, white cross on, on this on this spot, and then I can verify that. Uh, this, oh, by the way, in here I should switch to all frames, yeah. All frames. And now yeah. I can should verify that this cross on the same spot on all frames. So mm -hmm. it should uh, answer that, for example, here it's shifted significantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's actually answering the question from, uh, I, I remember who asked about how to improve the quality using several pins, uh, uh, mm -hmm. using pins from other view. So you can combine all together, uh, all pins together, but it would be really hard to understand what's going on. But using this manual uh, drawing uh, on top of the model, you can actually uh, verify that uh, the same uh, vertex of the mesh Locates on the same point uh, on uh, actor's face. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that we're gonna improve this pipeline a bit later, like yeah. creating probably some manual. Um, but this, but this is markers. incredibly powerful for you to paint things out. Like you could literally paint out a, a scar. You could paint out some signals. You can do a lot of beauty, beauty work, like beautification work using this strategy. Oh, if you want to, like, for example, remove like wrinkles or remove pimples or things like that, it's yeah, awesome. But yeah. it's not about uh, cleanup, obviously. Just your uh, because when we draw on top of uh, the wireframe, it's just for you to understand. Um, to actually to uh, mark some vertices and so on. To, yeah. Uh, so that you know where they are. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, then let's switch to a bit different example. Uh, Before you go to another example, I have mm -hmm. a really relevant question here from Matin uh -huh. Torabi CG Arts. I hope he's still here because the question is a bit old and I, I'm sorry I've missed your question, Matin. So his question is, do you have any plans to use artificial intelligence on your plugin? It looks like a good candidate for that. Uh, for example, matching different angles and delighting, etc. Exactly. We already actually implemented it internally and uh, now we are working to make a product out of it. So, uh, so you, you're you're looking into machine learning and those kind of things to try to get uh, the tool yeah, to 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 actually creating some initial uh, placement of the model on top of the surface. So mm -hmm. when you now you have to click center geo and instead of this button we create something like major keyframe button which places the model right on top of the face and you need to drag less number of pins then. Okay. Cool. So, very good, very good. Um, okay, let's switch to another example. And here we have just a footage. No knowledge about camera, uh, no knowledge uh, actually, and what is. Uh, let's, let's delete all cache. My favorite procedure when working with Nuke clearing cache. <laughs> so uh, we don't know anything about this footage, so no knowledge about camera, no knowledge about uh, focal lengths, no knowledge about... Uh, actually even actor has no uh, static neutral expressions as well. So we have to 
but we want to track her face. So we need to create her model first. And uh, let's wait while new clean its cache, finally. How long it is? I'm going to also close other nukes. Um, there's still there's still 65 people here watching. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you so much for sticking around. We had a peak of 100, but now we are back to 65. So it, there's still a lot of people here. If you have any questions, just feel free to write question in front so that I can read it out and we can try to answer the question. Um, you know, maybe now is a good time while we are having a crash to ask questions. <laughs> Anyone have a question? I'm gonna kill all nuke processes and reopen it again. Uh, file open reason colon key. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's so usual with Nuke. Okay, so here we are. Uh, so we have this footage. So let's briefly... Uh... <laughs> Joe, Joe has a question. When is the pandemic going to be over? <laughs> Do you have an answer for that? <laughs> well, I'm not a politician. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a follow-up question here from Eric. He says... Uh, Follow-up, not me add it as a custom, but can tools make, make, oh, this is about this, oh, sorry. This is actually to answer about if you would gonna do a standard, uh, like a, um, like an, uh, a version that you would just have a standalone. So never mind. sorry. Um, let's see here, Sajel has a question. He says, can individual licenses used for freelancers or is it just for R&D and learning also, if can I use for freelancer when I go for commercial license? Uh, yes, you can use personal licenses for any type of work, for commercial okay. work as well. So okay. there is no limitation uh, on this. Okay. Keep the questions coming, guys. But by the so way, guys, you... we have yeah. classrooms licenses. So if you are students, uh, you can uh, ask your tutor or to contact yeah. us and we will provide licenses free licenses yeah. for your university or school i'm going i'm going to i'm going to um, um talk with my students as well as you know i have a a, a, a a nuke complete course on kickstarter i have about 350 students and i i feel like i feel like this this software could be um a really really good pick for especially for cleanup and in, in work in composting so I'm going to talk to the my students about that. So, um, it seems that I've cached it and uh, we have such footage. Uh, she's smiling, she do different things and uh, we actually want to create her face as well. So, what we do in that case, we create face builder now. And uh, this time we create some just custom camera, uh, just standard camera here. But as we don't know camera, in Phase Builder, we say that it's some fixed focal lengths, but we don't know it. So it's, we don't mm. use focal lengths from camera, just fixed local length, lengths, and we can change it here, but it will automatically estimate it while we're dragging. So now I'm gonna find some uh, oh, wrong input. I'm gonna find some uh, frame which I'd like to use as a first frame. So something like three quarters. Uh, hopefully with open eyes. Uh, okay, let's for example start with this one. But you can clearly see that uh, she 
is not in neutral expression here. Uh, the expression is a bit is is a bit different. For example, here. Yeah. And in Face Builder, I can now tick this non-neutral expression checkbox. And now, when I drag, it will not only... Oh, what's going on? Please don't send it to Foundry. Uh, but let's reopen it. Hopefully it will... Uh, sometimes it happens. And uh, I'm not sure that it's our bug. Uh, most likely it's not. Uh, okay, let's click Central Geo, click Non-Neutral Expression and drag. Whoa! It's pretty strange, to be honest. Uh, it was fine. Uh, Dan, had, Dan Howard has a question. He says, sorry, back to lens distortion. Mm -hmm. It was just mentioned the node will automatically estimate the lens. Is there a way to state node distortion or it will always try to calculate? So Dan, the thing with this is that I think this is a different matter because lens distortion is dealt with a lens distortion node with a grid. So Maybe maybe I'm wrong with this assumption, but I'm assuming we would undistort the plate and the system, the face builder and the face tracker, doesn't really care if we undistort it or not. Like we just basically undistort the plate and and then it, it just calculates. So you're you're actually not undistorting or distorting anything inside your node, is it? Like your node is just keeping yeah, the pixels we, where they are. Yeah, yeah, we expect that the footage is already undistorted. Exactly, yeah. So there's no automated way. That's what I assumed. So then, to answer your question, the pipeline for this would be bring in the footage, undistort with the grid. You can then render out the footage with undistortion if you would prefer, or you can keep it live on the script. It's a bit heavy, though. And then you can pipe it into Face Builder or Face Tracker or any of these scan tools. And then once you're done with your cleanup or once you're done with your projections, once you're done with everything you're doing inside these uh, these plugins from CAN tools, you then have to apply the distortion back into the result. So that's the process. It will be the same process of when you're the same, it's the same, effectively it's the same process of distortion, distorting when you're working with uh, matte paintings or CG or anything, you know, it's the same with, like if you're doing a projection system in Nuke uh, to a, to a regular cube or a sphere or anything, you always want to undistort the footage before it gets projected. So that would that would be the, the way to go with it, you know. And so at the end, on the scan line render, just like on a projection system of a house or a building or a map painting, you would then apply the distortion back right after the scan line distortion, you know. That's how it would work then. Absolutely agree. So, <laughs> exactly <laughs> like Hugo said, and uh, oh, it, it almost looks like I know what I'm talking about. Almost looks like that. At least I fooled them, you know. <laughs> okay, so uh, I've set up everything again, and everything works. So I don't know why it was crashing, but okay, let's try again. So again, I've created two viewers to see what's going on. So now I drag pins. So again, first three pins just place the model. But now every next pin will not only uh, change the form of her face, but also uh, try to it will try to match the expression. So where is, where is she? So now she's smiling a little bit. Here. So the, the issue is that actually it also tries to um, find the correct focal length. So if you look at Face Builder, it will uh, try to estimate focal length distance. So now it's 62, but uh, probably it will change a little bit uh, in future. So we try to uh, now we 
actually is, we are solving really complex um, task like estimating focal lengths, estimating facial expression and estimation estimating facial form. So quite how the curiosity, how the curiosity, how accurate is this? Like have you tested it like by putting footage that you know the focal length and you try to do it manually? Does it actually go close enough to the actual real value when you do know? Well, uh, <clears throat> speaking about, for example, focal lengths, yes, we tested it and it's pretty close. So it's okay. uh, it's not like one millimeter close, but of course, yeah. five millimeter close. So, but so I mean, it's close enough. Like if it's a 50 mil and if it does 53 or 54 or 55, like it's, that's enough. Like, I mean, I guess that's... Yeah, I'm not expecting it to be perfect, of course. Uh, well, basically the idea is that uh, it all really depends on the form. So uh, we know how human face, uh, human head could look like. And we try to uh, match the projection and human face and so on in simultaneously. So sometimes, for example, face could be a bit different form and projection. Uh, uh, looks a bit different, so and that's why uh, it's it's not really um, completely accurate, mm -hmm. obviously, but it's uh, better than nothing. It's like yeah. it's yeah. like new candy. There's there are some limitations, but it's better than no new candy. <laughs> 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 don't get don't don't let's not start that that yeah. kind of work. <laughs> let's stop this discussion. <laughs> so um, uh, I have a quick question here from uh, Vishal Kamur Sharma. Mm -hmm. He says, "Can we use fake light with this for light projection on face?" Yeah, of course, so. of yeah, course. Uh, so. One of the important uh, application for face build and face tracker it's relighting. So yeah. you create model, you track it, and yeah. then do yeah. some relighting stuff. So okay, it's just now, one. But, but to but to but to to finish that conversation that Vishal Sharma is asking, there is one tricky thing about this, uh, Sharma. Like obviously, you can light by using lights in Nuke, and you can use the 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 project like the the projection to actually relight scenes, and they've done that many times. Like I think one of the first productions to do that was Veta Digital on King Kong. So on King Kong, what they did was they rotomated all the actors on certain shots, especially when they were being picked up by King Kong, and they used geometry to relight, you know. The problem, though, is the way that it's filmed. So what they did on King Kong was they filmed the actors on a very diffuse light with almost no shadows so that they would prevent to have baked lighting, you know. So that's the issue. On this situation, it's a bit tricky because you have so much baked light in the scene that even though you relight, you'll end up with a problem of two directions of light. You know, so that's an issue. Like where the the way it's filmed really like really instructs of how good this is gonna look or how good it's going to actually work. You know, so if you know that you're gonna do that beforehand, it's always best for you to try to film it with no shadows, you know. Okay, so let's continue. And so I've created the first keyframe. Uh, now I'm going to create the second one. For example, I took this uh, angle and now I'm going to roughly place her face first. Uh, and let's try to match the expression. <laughs> cool VFX is saying, could you ask Roman about if he's planning to make deep fake automation? So it's funny that he, that CoolVFX is asking this because, um, I mean, it seems to me like it would be a perfect fit for, for deep fake. Yes, actually, we are already thought about it and uh, we have some plans about integrating deep fake as well. Actually, be uh, you always have to be very careful with the uh, eyebrows uh, because uh, especially uh, for women because sometimes eyebrows are not on the place where they should be they could be higher lower uh, 
people know how to change it and uh, that's why uh, you sometimes have to guess where the uh, natural eyebrow should be uh, okay so let's create it here So now it's much, much closer. Okay, so let's now check the first keyframe. It's still okay. So let's find something, uh, probably some profile view. Uh, okay, profile. Okay, oh, I like this one. Uh, it's not profile, but it's pretty cool. Okay, here and not really. I see a lot of discussion on the chat about deep fakes. The the issue. What I, what I would like to tell the chat and also remind the chat is that uh, I've had this discussion last year when I was at the VIEW conference talking and I was talking a lot over dinner with a lot of VFX supervisors from VETA and from ILM and from a lot of different places. And we've had, a, we've had like, like discussions about deep fight, uh, about how it could replace certain things on VFX and how it could be used in film and everything. The problem about the deepfake, I think, at this stage is that it's not accurate enough. So it's not pixel perfect, and I think that is the problem of it being used in a high-end production. It can be used, of course, on YouTube videos and all these like deepfake videos you see. But if you look at these deep deepfake videos, there's always something wrong with them. You know, there's like a slight shift on the tracking, or the color is not completely right, or the shadow is a bit wrong. And I think YouTube really helps the deep fakes because YouTube is so compressed and so low quality that you actually don't notice that the deep fake is actually not that good. And I think if you would have used it in film, you would have seen it on the cinema how bad it is because the quality has to be so much higher. So I don't think deep fakes has any kind of chance to be used in production at the moment. I think deep fake is a bit for me and personally view in my personal view, it's a bit like the real-time engines. It's a great help for production as a first step, but then it can't really be used for the finishing. It has to be some manual labor and some extra work on top for it to really look good. So you can get really quick results and they look okay. It's a bit like using After Effects, you know? You can get some good results and they can look kind of okay. I'm talking about compositing, not motion graphics composting terms I mean but if you really want to go deep and really make a pixel perfect version for a film can't really rely on deep fakes a lot alone you know well uh, I want to add that uh, it's not only about quality but it also about uh, it's not controllable enough so you can't exactly fix yeah. it so yeah. you, you see that something goes wrong but you can't fix it because yeah. you can't control it and yeah. that's Currently, the main issue is uh, yeah, and it's it's technology. like like everything you know. Like the problem with this is that everyone that doesn't know anything about VFX sees deep fakes online, and they think it's the, going to be revolutionizing the industry because it's so much easier now. You can just do it, but it's not really that simple. And and if you know anything about VFX, you know that with feedback and client revisions, you can't really have something uncontrollable, you know? That's the same if you, imagine if you had Odini and you make a simulation and you couldn't change it, you know? Like the first simulation would be the one you would have to use. You can't really work that way, you know? Like 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 the clients want, they will want to change things. They will want to art direct things. The director will want to art direct things. Even yourself is, you are going to want to art direct things as well, you know? So that's that's very important to think about when thinking about deep fakes. Okay, so uh, I have placing now fourth keyframe here, and uh, 
Honestly, I'm like this is I'm... the same the same conversation that would go for artificial intelligence as well in in machine learning. I think I think the creative industry is actually still quite far off of being replaced by uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence just because of this of this nature of actually having to change things, feedbacking, responding, and doing variations and versions. I'm not entirely sure it is actually possible just yet to do that because it requires too many iterations for you to actually use machine learning in that way. I definitely think it's an amazing way to help, to help the first step. But in this creative industry, I still think there's quite a lot of input that has to be done by the person for this all to work. Okay, so I've done the uh, false keyframe, uh, uh, and so what we have now, we have several keyframes, uh, and one placed on them. We have estimated focal lengths, like 26, uh, and um, let's, for example, check uh, the and um, result. So let's took a look at face builder and click switch off output transform geometry, which actually deforms it. And uh, here's her model located in zero zero zero. And we can create, for example, uh, try to create uh, her texture with a texture builder. It obviously will look a bit. Ah, by the way, we should. We should use not this camera, but we should export estimated camera from Face Builder. Mm -hmm. So the one with the estimated focal length distance. And uh, here we connect geometry and background. So uh, and got a question here from. Um, let's see where is the question? Sorry. Oh yeah, from Dan Howard. He, sa he says. As the expression is model, uh, modulating in this, how is the builder deciding what is positioning versus uh, positioning slash shape versus versus expression changes? Oh, that's so, that's basically the magic. <laughs> so that's basically the thing which we were struggling a lot when creating such mode, uh, mm. and there is no difference. For example, in sometimes. It could be a bit, it's not only about posi its position, for, uh, shape, expression, and focal distance. So quite a lot of different unknown variables. Yeah. For example, it could be a bit uh, further and uh, at the same time uh, on more narrow angle of view and uh, yeah. longer distance, focal distance, or, yeah. or in contrast a bit closer and uh, on wider lens. So, yeah. Uh, and yeah, there are some special uh, things how, how we create it, but uh, actually it's even hard to explain. Not I, I, guess, I guess this is why when we have a very difficult shot like this, at least from my experience at, at the mill and Ubisoft and Sony, like we always do manual rotomation because we always end up having like a piece of geometry with a rig and then we just like have an animator matching it frame by frame in Maya, you know, because that is so far the only way we found to have an accurate, fully animated expressional face, you know. So for uh, some strange reason, I can create uh, texture out of it. What's going on? I can't understand. Ah, okay. Because in phase builder, I switched off transport uh, output transform geometry. Here it is. I guess there's like a, a, um, a follow up question here from Ar Credon. Uh, so he, he's talking about mocap in here. He says dynamic dynamic X Y Z uses uh, face mesh tracking to mocap the face. If can tools consider adding the facial mocap feature inside face face tracker? It would be great. Um, I don't. I don't believe that would work the same way because you're not really looking at the tracking features of the face. But am I wrong here saying that it wouldn't really work with with uh, with mocapping the face? 
Probably I didn't get the question. Uh, so, so, so the question says, uh, dynamics, dynamic X, Y, Z, which mm -hmm. I'm, 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 uses uh, same face mesh tracking to mocap the face. Mm -hmm. If CanTools considering adding the facial mocap features inside Face Tracker, it could, it would be great. So basically, he's, he's saying, why don't you? Could you use mocap data? Like, imagine if I guess if the face had markers or something, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, basically, you can use result of face tracker as uh, mocap data, and uh, probably the good start for this. Uh, recently, we've uh, uh, published uh, an add-on for face. Uh, it's called face rig and uh, we're gonna publish it uh, soon so we, it's already public but we didn't yet announce it and it's it's a small add-on for face build uh, for how's it called blender and uh, actually you can apply animation from face tracker to any other model using it uh, using locators and facial rig, and uh, you can apply this animation on any character. I see. Okay. So I created some rough texture of her face, uh, and uh, here it is. Uh, there are some issues with eyes because some on some angles of view they were closed, and uh, basically most of them. But uh, again, we actually have a face that is pretty close to her face so for example we can try to track it uh, it's not that hard so in face builder now we have some uh, let 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 me show you so in face builder we have several keyframes but actually the same keyframes we are gonna have in face tracker so now in face builder mm. we can even export face tracker from it so I export face tracker and but it should be exported to different camera okay and in face tracker let's open it uh, let's close it close this pane and uh, oh it looks pretty strange what's going on some Expressions are wrong. Uh, why so? Everything looks messy. Ah, okay. Because face builder should I should switch off transform geometry here. Okay. Uh, yeah, here it is. So now in face tracker, uh, I can click track forward okay I can't cl click it without pre-analysis data but I already calculated its nuke uh, go to K so let's create it and let's track it forward and we're gonna discuss it next time so of course there are some issues and uh, we Gonna add some pins to fix them. Uh, but yeah, so so the discussion continues here with the with the mocap, and I think that's what my first reaction was that it wasn't really gonna really work in that sense. So cool, cool VFX is saying, I think this is not useful. You mean can we can we our position face with face builder and same time attach mocap data to blend with specific vertices to animate this data through together that's the thing i don't i don't think it would work with mocap because mocap relies on tracking points directly to the face which would be attached to geometry but that's not really what can tool is doing here i i as i understood it so far like you are actually you're actually deforming a piece of geometry to fit the face right. you're not necessarily attaching these points to a specific place in the face it's right. not really the same, I think. You know? yeah, yeah, so basically, um, speaking about it, uh, I've uh, got this question as, uh, is, would it be possible to use 
face tracker as a mockup uh, is a source of mockup data. Like oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Like whether it's possible to use uh, result of face tracker as uh, mockup data for uh, for using it with, with some other. Uh, piece of geometry, like for example, to use these uh, expressions on other character or mm -hmm. of completely mm -hmm. different uh, structure. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, it's actually I'm now showcasing face tracker, and it's a story for the next uh, <laughs> for the next stream. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but uh, again, so now it's possible to get the face. Oh, whoa, whoa! Too many wrong. F uh, yeah, I guess we we're, we're going we're going off topic, really. Um, I guess I guess I'll ask the chat. Like, is there any questions at this stage from what we saw so far? Anyone who wants to. If we have time, I don't know if we have time though, though for some questions. Uh, well, uh, honestly, I think that we are almost done with this stream. I mean that we uh, mm -hmm. go almost through all features. Next time we're going to talk about tracking. By the way, it seems uh, I don't like the model that we get because it seems that it has a bit wrong uh, bottom lip because it's too far uh, from the upper lip. So yeah, it's easy to fix. Just let's add more keyframes, especially uh, from um, uh, how it's called uh, profile view. How to see it? Uh, let's let's find it. Yes. Yeah, so George, uh, George here, George Marmotas is saying uh, to you, uh, is actually telling you, Roman, that you are amazing. Look at that. That's nice. Thank okay. you, George. <laughs> <laughs> that you've been amazing. <laughs> so Jell is asking a question regarding the licensing again. Uh, he's asking, I stream on Twitch, showcasing my CG processes and visual effects. Would that qualify as a teacher student license? Uh, please contact us uh, by team at kintools.io, and uh, we gonna and we will discuss it. Mo most likely, it looks like uh, that you are a trainer, and as a trainer, we would be happy to provide you uh, with a free license for this. Yeah, I will definitely chase you on up on that because. Um, after I've seen what you've done here, Roman, like I'm very impressed. I'll tell you, like I'm extremely impressed by this, and um, and I think that I would love to do some classes or even maybe some YouTube videos about this because I see an enormous potential for cleanup, for advanced cleanup on this sense. By, of course, by doing it the the the, the full way, you know, with undistortioning and then using your nodes and then going out again. So. Definitely gonna chase you up on that about that license for training. Oh. So yeah, I'm gonna add some more keyframes here. But yeah, you know, it's like uh, with any other tool, it's just uh, no limit for perfection. So you always, of course, of course, um, can do it better and better. And of course, uh, for example. Me personally, I know how to use it. I know I'm I'm a bit uh, used to it because I'm developing it. But uh, sometimes, uh, please do not uh, be upset if you don't get the proper result from the first time. So sometimes, yeah, of course, of sometimes course. you have to, for example, yeah, you need here, to learn. Need to learn first, of course. It, it's really hard uh, task now because we again we are trying to estimate position, focal length, and uh, shape and expressions, and all together. But again, uh, potentially, uh, 
uh, and we actually already got really good results for this. Now during the stream, of course, I do it a bit rough because I'm first of all I'm boring a bit, and the second thing, actually, uh, we don't have time to do it in a proper way. But yeah, again, I, I got the result. Let's check the face builder now. Uh, this um, I have a I have a, a, a quick question here from Cool VFX. Uh -huh. He's asking uh, to ask you, Roman, uh, about morph animation transition. For example, human to wolf animation. Is that possible? Well, you can use face track result with some other geometry of other um, some with some other face. For example, mm -hmm. I can take this face tracker and apply uh, these deformations for some other uh, face builder, for example. So you can do kind of a, a face swap with these techniques. We will cover it in the next, uh, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. the next one, but probably in uh, the, uh, the one after the next one uh, stream and show how to do face swap stuff. But um, Unfortunately, you can't use this for, for example, animating of wolf or some other creature, um, because, uh, to be honest, expressions of human face are really different from wolf or any, yeah. uh, any, uh, any or for example, monkey. Even yeah. monkey has completely different yeah. set of expressions. I, I actually would say to answer to Cool VFX, I don't think this would be the solution at all to do that kind of effect. Cool VFX. I think what you're talking about is a pure morph, and I think you should actually do it inside a 3D application. It would you will get much better result by using this in Maya by doing deformations, blend shaping, animation, you know, those kind of things. Uh, I Because you actually, I think for you to do a morph between a human and a wolf, I think you need rigs for that. I don't believe you can just do it by like distorting the geometry. I think that's going to really give you a lot of problems on texturing, stretching, UVs, a lot of problems. So to verify how good is the uh, uh, actual uh, geometry, I now uh, gonna take GeoTracker, and GeoTracker do not uh, deform the geometry, and use it with this uh, face builder. So I've used face builder as an input for GeoTracker, and let's uh, place it. Try to place it. Let's try to place it and check whether it looks okay or not. So the thing is that, of course, uh, seems it a bit wider than it should be. Yeah, just a little. But it's pretty okay. It's pretty okay. Let's switch off uh, here. Here's um, how, to, how to do it. Where is my note graph? Uh, let's switch off ears, uh, and neck, and head back. And in GeoTracker, uh, where's my keyframe? Where's my keyframe? Why? Why is here? What's happened with it? That's funny. Uh, why so? Uh, GeoTracker. Don't know what's going on. Let me check. Mm. Oh, too much information. GeoTracker and. Uh, yeah. I don't know why, but it's placed in, in the center. Uh, so yeah, let's unpin it and pin it again. So I just want to try to um, check whether I can track it with GeoTrack, for example. Why not? Uh, oh. Cool. 
can roughly place it here. And now in GeoTrack I need some pre-analysis file. Again, this is the same file. And let's try to track it. Mm, I see. That's pretty cool. Yeah, we can, of course, we can fix it. Uh, fix the tracking a little bit. Yeah, the thing is that we can't track uh, expressions in GeoTracker, but sometimes you don't need it. Like, for example, if you want to do some cleanup uh, stuff, for example, for... Here, here's a question, actually, for, for you, Roman. Mm -hmm. um, imagine I'm doing a complex scene where I have, I've done a 3D track inside of Nuke using the camera tracker, mm -hmm. and I have a complete solve done which is like very accurate, you know, with a very low um, reprojection error. Mm -hmm. How how do I go around? Does it actually work for me to like, if I go to use your tools and I do a face track like we're doing here huh? on a person that is on this scene that I've tracked R already in Nuke, Correct. is there any way of me actually merging these two scenes so that my face track yeah, matches my Nuke track, my camera track? Absolutely. When you use, uh, you, you just take your camera from Nuke and use it as an input for face tracker, and it will place a model exactly on its position in 3D Sun. I see. So it's more than straightforward. Really simple. I see. I see. So you can merge. Yeah. So you can match up the lenses and the. Yeah. Okay. I see. So okay. You, you just take your camera as a. Uh, source of information about the scene so yeah let's take and then you would have to find where to where it would exist in the scene but that that could be done by because obviously when you're tracking in the camera data you will get like tracking markers in certain positions you'll get like point clouds so you can then use the point cloud to figure out where this face should be in this the yep. environment, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, we've covered uh, th all the stuff in details on the very first stream when okay. I showed how to place uh, the model if you know the uh, data, how to match scale, for, because uh, the face that we created could be of different scale. I see. By That's the way, it. yeah. So I need to watch that then. I need to watch that. I haven't watched the first stream. I only saw the stream with Victor. Uh, before, yeah, actually, the first stream was quite a small one because uh, just we just started. So yeah, I, I'm just playing with it. So uh, to yeah. try I see. track it, and it. Uh, uh, so to answer the question from Sajel here, this will never work for rotoscoping. No, Sajel. Unfortunately, rotoscoping is too precise. I don't. I don't believe we would get a perfect pixel edge on this process like it it would be very difficult for it to be the exact perfect edge pixel to pixel um i mean it could be a start of a roto but then i still think you would have to add manual shapes for the rotoscoping but it's good uh way to create a garbage mod so it's a fast oh, way yeah, to create absolutely. a garbage absolutely. mod for example if you want to track some object in the scene you first yeah. need to mask out this object and track camera. And to mask out yeah. this object, you can easily track it first, roughly, then create garbage mart and then use yeah. it for, yeah. 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 for yeah. track. So, yeah. I t I t I t to answer like the question that now just showed up from Reactive Zone, we just, we just spoke about this, Reactive Zone. So I was asking that as well to Roman, like if it could handle a camera track together with this track. And yes, it is possible for you to merge both as one single 3D system yeah, to have so the face in the 3D system. If you have a camera, you just use it instead of this uh, template camera, like uh, static camera. So yeah. sometimes you don't need it, but uh, some. Yeah. If you don't need the exact position in 3D space, you can use just static camera. But if you yeah, need moving camera, you can use it. Yeah, and, of course. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so basically, let's sum up everything that uh, I've shown today. So, um, face builder. 
it's a pretty fast way to create the model. Usually you need four, five, six, seven angles of view and it, if you practice, practiced enough it will take like 10 or 15 minutes. It works for all genders, races, sages uh, and uh, you can also estimate focal lengths if you don't know the focal length and you can uh, use it not only with neutral expressions like it was in the very first release. So now you can also um, try to find some, um, to estimate expressions as well. Also it supports different UV maps which is really handy in some cases. And yeah. also I've shown Texture Builder which is currently in beta and uh, it's view based blending tool. So it's blend different projections based on viewing angle and uh, take only unstretched pixels. Uh, it works not only for faces but it was created firstly for face builder but it can be used for any cleanup and any clean plate work and it supports uh, alpha channel to for example, mask out some objects from different angles of view. For example, if you want to mm -hmm. mask out a rig, you, you need to draw a simple mask on, on it and match mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. except it. And uh, basically that's it. If we have any more questions, if you, Hugo... There's two, there's two that I would like to put forward. They might be short though, don't worry. Uh, first of all, yeah, CoolVFX is asking, uh, can tools not making animation of cameras, right? So that is correct. This is not an animated camera. That's why it works with the camera tracking, because like, this is just the geometry of the object itself, of the face, not of the camera. So there's no animated camera. But uh, you can in, use in GeoTracker for camera tracking. So yeah. you can, uh, if you have scene geometry, you can track camera based on scene geometry. For example, if you have uh, some LiDAR scan, you can do camera tracking uh, uh, based on it. And it's amazing pipeline because it's mm -hmm. much faster than uh, usual way of uh, tracking. The camera with, tracker. With yeah. just camera tracker. Because, yeah. especially for long shots, you can split the sequence based on keyframes. Mm -hmm. and track uh, all these parts independently. I see. And it's just like, we are we, uh, on probably two streams. Oh, let me check. Uh, yeah, when we are, we are talking about probably all basics or basics. tips and tricks, yeah. uh, I've showed cases how to track camera based on geometry and it can track focal lengths as well and so it's just uh, sometimes it's faster to for example track the first shot create the um, model of the scene with face builder or uh, not face builder but model builder and then use this geometry to track all other shots in these locations for if you have mm -hmm. lots of shots in one location it's much faster Okay, and the second so question I, was I, the the question the the second question from Matten from CG Arts is asking how does deformation work under the hood? Is it using soft modifiers or some sort of joint system or maybe both? Well, uh, it has a kind of statistical approach, so we know how generally people can um, look like. So, uh, we have a um, database of uh, many, many, many scans of different people and based yeah. on this data, uh, data, we can develop a model of deformation and we know, for example, is if, uh, if your model is wide, it deforms everything wide, uh, if your face is long then it deforms everything like for example if you have long face uh, most likely you have uh, thick uh, 
neck for example and it will automatically deform neck as well and that's why it's so fast to use you don't need to uh, drag lots of different pins for all different uh, mm -hmm. parts of the model I see. so yeah so it's, it's statistical based approach inside uh, but in future we're gonna add some additional deformations like soft deformations on top of it okay well i'm gonna wrap up with the last question this will be the end of the questions um because i thought it was an interesting question because it kind of dealt with rotomation really because at the moment rotomation is mostly done in in maya or something are you actually looking into doing a full body tracking or maybe other parts of the body this is a question from sajal uh, well, basically, the last stream with Victor Paris, we uh, actually showcases, uh, showcased our uh, current R&D on full body tracker. Uh, and uh, just I'd like just to refer to the previous stream. Uh, please take a look and uh, write us what you think, uh, what you think about yeah. it. It's very powerful. I saw that. And, and I, I, I would say to Sajel and to everyone on the stream, go and watch the previous stream. It's really good. It's really good. The, the one with Victor Paris, I think it was last week or the week after, a week before or something like that. I think it was even three weeks ago. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I think that's it. There's no more other questions here. I don't see any more. So. Great. Then uh, please join our Discord server and uh, ask any questions here, uh, there, and here, we are gonna answer it. And uh, we also have a uh, uh, email subscription for our viewers and we send news about new streams as well as all materials from the previous streams. So you can play with it on your own. And uh, if we have no more questions, and probably, Hugo, you have some questions. No, no, I, I don't think I do. Like, I think I've been asking you while we were doing the stream, and some of the questions were the similar questions from the, the chat. So I'm very impressed, very impressed, Roman. And I think it's really, really powerful, and I can't wait to, like, give it a big, big shake. Um, but, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think I have anything else that I would like to add. I think... I think we had a really good session and a lot of really good questions. I really enjoyed it. So thank you so much to everyone that came and everyone that made such cool questions for us to actually had a really good conversation for almost three hours now. It's been two hours and a half. It's been really yeah. nice. We still have, yeah. still have 50 people here, which is very, very, very cool. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Hugo, for joining us today. And thank you for all your questions and discussions. I really enjoyed it. And uh, cool. Excellent. I me too. Hope I um, convinced you to give it a try in uh, your school. Or oh, you did. You did. I can guarantee you. I'm going to give it a go for sure, <laughs> and I'm going to start using it in production. And and I'm also going to look into this for my classes for my Nuke course as well because I think it could be very beneficial for them to learn it as well. So yeah, I will. Don't worry. Uh, congratulations by the amazing tool set in the new R&D as well. So thank you, folks, and uh, subscribe to our social networks. We will inform you when we're going to have the next stream. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.